Thomas Alva Edison was an American inventor and businessman who has been described as America's greatest inventor. Was he? Or was he, as so many internet posts have begun to assert, a thief, a douche, an idiot, and a fraud? Today, I want to dissect the man who divides people's perception in two, the wizard of Menlo Park, good old Tommy E, whose previously venerated legacy now seems to be collapsing under scrutiny a century later. Is he our greatest inventor or nothing but a stealing prick, piggybacking off the toil of real geniuses like Nikola Tesla? Since his very first hit invention, the photograph, he has always been, in a way, a perfect American emblem, symbolizing our country's supposed inventiveness and bootstrappedness. He practically cemented himself in our pantheon. Americans were asked, who are the two most important people in the history of the world? And, and invariably, the top two people were Jesus Christ and Edison. That's sourceless, but bafflingly believable. However, this is all too abstract for my taste. Let's take a moment to look at the why of his fame and what's really at stake every time you see, say, a post implying Edison is a quack and a charlatan. But we also need a good refresher because some people have only scribbled his name in an apish study guide and forgotten about him or aren't American. Without further ado, allow me to polish his glue cannon to give you a good idea of the old popular interpretation of his legacy. Nothing but the highlights, really. Thomas Edison fought a self-proclaimed lack of public schooling, near total deafness, and probable ADHD to rise to the top of late 19th century capitalist America. And in total, his resume stretches from his over a thousand patents, a record that stood for some time, to the less obvious things, like how he practically pioneered the basis for modern research facilities. His first establishment, the Menlo Park Laboratory, became the first institution set up with the specific purpose of producing constant technological innovation and improvement. In the late 1800s, our went from standing for razzle and dazzle to research and development. Some argue Menlo Park and later West Orange, then Port Myers, set the fundamental model for today's university, government, and big tech labs of a similar nature. The fact that it was so revolutionary is only half of it. Edison, not a famous politician or artist, quickly became a national icon, an unprecedented figurehead behind driving a brave new industry forward, kicking off the era of captains of barons slash industry robbers. What's more, I don't know if you noticed as it flew by, but those patents covered quite a bit of ground. In no particular order, they included innovations in telegraphy, vacuum pump improvements, the mimeograph, the stock ticker, a fruit preserving method, the carbon microphone, some hauntingly creepy dolls, a method to refine iron ore with electromagnets, fluoroscopy, the motion picture camera, aka the first moving image, you know, like what makes this video possible in the first place, and he made advances in chemical production after he spotted a market niche for substances that we we one caused a shortage of. And of course, I'm trying to give the lesser known ones, because there's also, kinda ironic for a deaf man, the phonograph, the first machine capable of recording and reproducing sound, and the process mechanizing one of the last truly ephemeral things on the planet. And of course, the incandescent lamp, better known as the light bulb. Averaged across his adult life, he patented something roughly every 11 days. 11 days. Remember, this is all technically true. Everything you've heard, not even capping my brethren, them's the straight diggity facts. It's just been, uh, well, a bit deceptively framed, at least in some places. Exemply gratae, he patented the light bulb. That doesn't mean he necessarily invented it, but we'll get to that specific notion later. Point is, this is the sugar-coated cherry-picked legacy, the one people complain about when they hear it given in school without the controversy attached. So let's dive into the criticism and use some images and articles I found online to base this video around. Half because some people haven't even gotten a whiff of all the anti-Edison sentiment there is online, but also using these tools is nice because it'd be foolish to attempt to cover even a fraction of his entire life legend and controversy. A project like that would balloon and become too unwieldy and incohesive to finish. Only a fully rigged, great A1 ocean-going pillock would ever consider wasting time on something like that. Anyway, I can think of no better place to start the controversy than with everyone's favorite Serbian hunk, Nikola Tesla. Most of it gives of how done to death and completely circle jerk this topic is. Even if you worship him, the parody posts have started to become funnier than the originals. There is no more primate example of revering Tesla as a supreme being with a boundless mind wrong, pummeled, and stolen from by Big Bad Stinky Edison than an oatmeal comic that went viral around a decade ago and substantially altered public opinion. 
This wonderful Forbes article by Alex Knapp beautifully and succinctly points out all of its flaws, and I will be drawing heavily from it with regards to Tesla. It was even responded to by the Oatmeal author, another source of criticism I'll be putting on the table. But first, I need to give the briefest possible background I can on the War of the Currents. The early electrification of America had about three major players, Thomson Houston, Westinghouse, and Edison Electric. A lot of home appliances were, and still are, powered by direct current, or DC, but alternating current, or AC, lends itself to long-distance transmission a lot better than DC. Thomson, Houston, and Westinghouse built their electric empires on AC generation stations, incurring more cost per customer because each home or business would need transformers to convert the AC to lower voltages and then DC in some cases, but ultimately necessitating fewer, chonkier power plants. Edison, with a patchwork network of super range short DC plants, was adamant that AC was more dangerous than DC, a claim that seems silly today but was a genuine question back then. Everything was. Good old Mr. Electric gets a lot of flack for the side he took, but we only poo poo on his pride during this time because AC won out and we take that for granted nowadays. By the time it became apparent AC was the better move, Edison Electric had dumped everything into DC, while the namesake himself was losing influence in his own company. Soon, Thomson Houston and other Edison companies merged, ousting Edison himself in the process, to form General Electric, practically ending the current war. You might be wondering why I went on such a tangent. It provides context for later criticisms, but for right now, I want you to notice what name you haven't heard in that entire synopsis. Nikola Tesla. Despite what this panel says and what many say online, Tesla did not invent alternating current and he was not a major power in the war of the currents. Peep this timeline right here of all the names we have to thank for AC. This is where Tesla fits in. Those developments were more than substantial, sure, but he was not a titan. He was just a brilliant man that made notable contributions to AC. Westinghouse was Edison's rival. Westinghouse was the man Edison tried to slander and get the upper hand against. In fact, you know what Edison wrote about Tesla, his supposed rival? Nothing. And as for that one and a half million dollars that Edison supposedly duped Tesla out of because of a joke? Basically, there's only one primary source, and I personally think it implies it wasn't even Edison who made the joke. The rest, including that sarcastic remark about American humor, is probably speculation or embellishment. All other evidence points to the fact that the two just viewed each other as colleagues. Edison did not steal from Tesla. Edison employed him for about six months, and then he left over a misunderstanding about compensation, that joke I just mentioned. There are allegations about Edison stealing in general, notably one big thing, which we'll get to, but the narrative that Edison actively tried to steal from and stifle the untapped genius of Tesla just has no basis in fact. From what I understand, Tesla pitched AC to a company invested heavily in DC and to a man who thought, for whatever reason, that AC was more dangerous. It went how you'd think. Then he left over a disagreement, but that salutation was inevitable. Tesla was a visionary, not a worker bee. He would then be screwed over by the company he founded after leaving Edison Machine Works, sending him from CEO to ditch digger, a position he would eventually ascend from and become the brilliant scientist we remember him as. Quite inspirational. So why don't we teach him on an equal footing as Edison? Or at all? To that question, well, why isn't William Stanley or any of these inventors there too, who made comparably substantial, if not more, contributions to electricity? This seems like a cop-out, but allow me to genuinely explain. Edison thrived contemporaneously with the robber barons, like Rockefeller and Carnegie, whom we also learn about in school. Americans place their values with people like that, the people on top. That's not something I really agree with, but admittedly, if we did slot in every genius, every polymath, every person who made a notable contribution to science and had some admirably quirky ideas, we'd get lost in a sea of names and forget the bigger picture. Edison was a part of the bigger picture. He invented the phonograph, claimed the invention of the light bulb, collected a thousand more patents, founded the basis for modern research facilities, and ascended to the upper echelons of celebrity because of his successful career during an era where it was often joked that the average American man would consider his life a failure if he had not one patent to his name by the time of his death. He was the emblem of the zeitgeist. I'm not saying it should be this way, I'm just explaining the practical reasons behind what many use as justification to drag Edison's entire legacy through the mud and ascend Tesla to godhood. Tesla was not a giant. He was a good, upstanding guy with great ideas who made contributions to many scientific fields and then died. Just like Edison. They were both human. 
We'll get to the concept of justifiable demonization later, but what the old Beale gets objectively wrong is that there isn't even a side to pick. There was little to no bad blood. There's only one negative allegation that the Forbes article makes against Tesla, and I'm only bringing it up because it ties in with Edison quite well. I'm not trying to perpetuate the stick measuring contest between the two. People love memeing about Tesla's death ray that never really went anywhere, but the Forbes article rightfully points out that Mr. Lightbulb did have a one-up on Tesla in that regard, theoretically at least. Edison often touted that he never invented anything to kill, which was a lot more boastful a statement back then, because most of his imperialist Victorian contemporaries, like Hiram Maxim, if you recognize the name, could not say the same. Tesla's death ray was actually intended as a war deterrent, which sounds bafflingly naive, but as the oatmeal rightfully points out, he was off his rocker by then. I really can't hold it against him. But I bring this up because the oatmeal then completely erroneously asserts Edison invented the electric chair, another common remark that can be found online. A dentist, Alfred Suffolk, theorized the electric chair and passed it on to a state committee that was tasked with its construction all before it landed in Edison's lap. And when it did, Edison merely, well, merely is admittedly a funny word here, funded the inevitable invention to use a Westinghouse AC dynamo instead of a DC dynamo to perpetuate the idea that AC was more deadly than DC. A claim that I'm glad I brought up because it brings us back to the War of the Currents. Dig into Edison and it won't be long before you see a reference to Topsy the Elephant's horrific demise. For example, in this image with about 30k upvotes on the meme subreddit, a place known for harboring quality content, I think. While there were undeniably cases of legitimate animal abuse that we'll get into in a second, Topsy the Elephant was a victim of her captors, not Thomas Edison. She killed a man and then became uncooperative. She didn't deserve her fate, but this was not an Edison orchestrated show. He was nowhere near. Her circus planned to hang her. I don't know how you hang an elephant, but they decided to opt for a new, more ethical method of execution. Electrocution. But by this point, it had been displayed time and time again that animals could easily be electrocuted. How was that displayed? Aha, well, you see, babe, aha, well. There's no two ways about it. Someone who would eventually be outed as colluding with Edison, Harold Brown, paid local children to round up stray dogs that he could electrocute to prove that AC was more dangerous than DC. While I'm pretty sure Edison did not have a personal hand in this animal cruelty, in some instances he basically did everything but pull the switch, giving Brown, in one case, space and equipment at the West Orange Laboratory to demonstrate the killing power of AC on a horse. And yeah, here's where it becomes subjective and controversial, so I'll try and wrap this notion up. I personally think that at this time, humanitarianism and empathy were not values you're expected to cultivate. In fact, you're ostracized if you did. Animal rights in America was in its infancy, pretty much still fringe. And at this time, even other humans were thought of as lesser, unfeeling creatures. You're welcome to disagree because this was objectively reprehensible with the moral standards of today, even if you thought the ends would have justified the means. But would they have? I purposely have been dodging this because no one truly knows what was going on in Edison's kaleidoscopic mind at the time, why he was so adamant DC was the way to go. It's intimidating to approach this topic because if you don't just slap down the excuse that Edison wanted to profit from his DC patents and then move on like most popular accounts, you'll find a good deal of nuance because, well, AC eventually proved to just be cheaper than DC by a long shot. Edison was anti-AC till the bitter end, till he was forced out of his own company for that belief, hardly the move an entrepreneur would make if they wanted to maximize profit, or get any profit, all in the supposed name of AC being more dangerous than DC. And that fact itself? Well, it's basically true as far as I understand, but it strikes me as comparing a pistol to a semi-automatic rifle. One might be more dangerous than the other, you can potentially survive either, but they're both still guns. No one really knew this in the early stages of the War of the Currents. I personally find it believable that Edison at first thought AC was more dangerous. And no, I'm not trying to say that this was for pompous humanitarian reasons. He had to fight the public's negative perception of electricity and its lethality. AC lines carelessly crisscrossing bustlingly busy boroughs threatened to halt any future expansion of electric power, because the public could turn on it and figure the potential danger isn't worth the price for convenience. But those incidents soon proved to be few in number compared to, say, the deaths caused by automobiles. This all being said, surprise, surprise, I am actually not going to continue to stroke Edison's DC system because, in my onion, his reasoning just became hubris at some point. 
Allow me to explain. But first, one of the more general accusations against Edison's character is his presumed greed, probably going off of certain quotes like those on screen. But honestly, I don't think this was his motivation. He had no knack nor seeming desire to squeeze out as much money as he could from his inventions, as he would move on from project to project constantly. He hardly ever truly was or wanted to be a Sigma business magnate CEO. I believe all he really wanted was prestige, from the first Wizard of Menlo Park headline to his death. He was obsessed with the practical because that's what would get him widespread recognition. The market filtered his inventions from when he was a pauper with an ailing mother till he became the wizard, the title plucking his little nearly deaf self out of backwater. Michigan. So it comes as no surprise that to a reporter's question, what is your object in life? What do you want? Edison answered, I guess all I want now is to have a big laboratory for making useful inventions. He then continued, there isn't a bit of philanthropy in it. Anything that won't sell, I don't want to invent because anything that won't sell hasn't reached the acme of success. Its sale is its proof of utility and utility is success. I think people assume greed here because he, in my opinion, pitifully used the market to gauge his success. And buried beneath all the Sigma trillionaire grindset-esque quotes, he literally said, I don't care so much for a fortune as I do for getting ahead of the other fellows. In the end, it is just in my completely personal opinion after reading much, much more about Edison than I ever wanted to, that he didn't want to take the knee to Westinghouse. It goes without saying that this pride was a major flaw and is a criticism against Edison that is more true than I think most people who level it know. The last few points in the Oatmeal Forbes incident I'm going to skip for the sake of time and practicality. I know, I know, you probably think I'm being a naughty little goober that deserves to be stepped on for withholding what could be major Edison BTFOs, but as an example, there's not much you can disprove when the basis for the argument is something like, Edison should have known in the early 1900s that x-rays would horribly disfigure and eventually kill his assistant, which by the way left Edison to carry an immense guilt for the rest of his life, because Tesla said so. And this gives me a free pass to childishly berate Edison for trying to break new ground in radiation research and learning a grave lesson in the process. On that topic, can I just complain about something? Reading this oatmeal comic and the author's retort to the Forbes article is like pulling teeth. I only mention this because you might get a kick out of it or hopefully think about what I have to say about it. Trying to convince the public of an ultimate, possibly noble truth is only the author's second goal, the first being to stylishly dunk on any disagreement as sardonically as possible. I suggest the oatmeal justifies this because it's all in the name of comedy, in this case the style that just throws out obscenities, which admittedly isn't my thing and has not aged well at all, but it just comes off as petulantly indignant in so many ways, and I honestly think you can't justify these bad faith jokes if you know you're responding to someone who wants to remind the public of the reality behind the comedy, not nitpicking minor errors. The bigger message is exactly what's being attacked. If it is our responsibility to not sharpshoot comedy, then it is theirs to not reply to factual critique with this much disrespect. You can't just say, haha, it was only comedy and an attempt to inspire the geek masses when I called you a pedantic chathid uh, for attempting to say Edison wasn't a miserly devil. Theorizing why the Edison v Tesla narrative blew up is above my pay grade, but I think the oatmeal and the general public's behavior can at least partially be explained by this quote from Aldous Huxley, which has seen a revival recently but bears repeating. The surest way to work up a crusade in favor of some good cause is to promise people they will have a chance of maltreating someone, to be able to destroy with good conscience, to be able to behave badly and call your bad behavior righteous indignation. This is the height of psychological luxury, the most delicious of moral treats. I don't really blame Reddit teenagers or the oatmeal for falling prey to that. As some commenters rightfully point out, the author was just unknowingly perpetuating bias. And online, it's hard not to jump on the bandwagon when you think you found the next The Pilgrims Cooperated with the Native American Style Lie. What separates the wise from the naive, however, is a willingness to change your viewpoint and acknowledge your previous failings. Even if the oatmeal tries to pass it all off as inspirational infotainment, they do concede some things, at least. Having said everything I have, I feel like there are some things that we haven't come across that Edison actually does deserve criticism for. In no particular order, it's time for a lightning round. 
What would have been a minor point had Edison not been placed on a pedestal for his rags to riches genius legacy is the fact that he did have public schooling. He had at least three years of formal education as a child, a stint that was not unusually short in the rural Ohio and Michigan of his youth. And as a budding inventor, he also attended classes in chemistry at New York City's Cooper Union after realizing that his self-taught knowledge of that science was inadequate. There are other allegations that Edison neglected his family that have credibility behind them. Inventing wasn't just a day job. He nicknamed his children Dot and Dash as an homage to Morse code, which was used in the cutting edge technology of his day, his beloved, beloved telegraphy. The modern equivalent would be about two decades ago before CompSci became practically pop culture, nicknaming your children one and zero or bit and bite, like some endearingly awkward yet unfunny STEM major. On top of this, Edison even proposed to his wife in Morse code. Granted, I'm painting an unfair image of him because of our modern connotation with savant tech enthusiasts, but the point is, he found much more joy in the lab than in his kids. And factually, it is not disputed, he hardly saw them at all. Although that wasn't really uncommon for Victorian well-to-dos, make of this what you will. He quote, neglected his two wives and six children. He lavished material goods on them, but otherwise paid scarcely any attention to them. In fact, he rarely slept at home, preferring the laboratory. His first wife died grossly overweight, and his second one said their marriage had been no great love. Was this excusably on par with the times or not? You decide. I don't like the idea that we should write off Edison as a successful businessman because he just wasn't. I'm slotting this in with criticism because he was comically bad. For example, when you put a near deaf man in charge of choosing what music should be printed to the phonograph, he's going to make some missteps. Even then, after plopping that groundbreaking invention on the world, he casted his golden goose aside with the same degree of interest as a boarding school miss would allude to a discarded doll. And then he moved on to other projects. He made many, many blunders. For example, as an anonymous director of one of his companies leaked to the press, how once Edison proposed installing a new cable in Manhattan that would cost nearly 30,000 a mile, oblivious to the fact that Western Union had one with similar capacity and operation that had only cost 500 a mile. That and other blunders led that director to go on to say, if Edison would leave it to the practical businessmen to make money out of it and stick to his inventions, the company would in time become very rich. This was a pattern. Something that's very common online that hasn't come up is the movie industry. You might have heard the reason American film is centered around Hollywood and the West Coast in general is because Thomas Edison was ruthless in enforcing his movie camera patents. And yeah, this is pretty much true. His practices were extremely predatory. It's still sensationalized sometimes. For example, the trust was exactly that, an exploitative trust formed of many organizations and not a group of hired thugs that served Edison's beck and call, as this article seems to imply. There are allegations that this organization, the Motion Picture Patents Company, used violence threats and in one case made attempts on Cecil B. DeMille's life. The majority were proven, but honestly, as an example for those that went unproven, I can imagine anyone else who would want to assassinate Cecil B. DeMille, of all people. You might be wondering where one major fact check is, something that's probably been on your mind after I mentioned it a while ago and have been purposefully dancing around it since. The light bulb. When it comes to the invention of the electric lamp, nearly everyone misses the nuance. No, Edison was not the first to design a light bulb-like device. That honor, as most people offer up, ought to go to Joseph Swan, whose patent would win out in Britain, Edison everywhere else. Swan is the man I believe gets second place in nominations for the real inventor of the light bulb, so it seems pretty clear cut, right? Well, all Swan contributed was the idea of using a carbon filament, which Edison heard about and thought there was real potential in. He came across Swan's published material while he had been working on the light bulb problem himself for quite a while, toying with metals instead. That material switch, though, was a breakthrough. The idea of using an organic filament eventually proved to be what turned the light bulb from a novelty to an invention. But Swan's own bulb lasted only 40 hours. For context, that's about how long I lasted with your mother. Edison, on the other hand, tested thousands and thousands of different organic materials in his labs on an industrial scale. No one knows the exact number because no one kept count. But, and take this with a grain of salt, his own account of this reads, before I got through, I tested no fewer than 6,000 vegetable growths and ransacked the world for the most suitable filament material. It was a formidable task because in order for the carbonized plant materials to not combust in the bulb, Edison had to diverge from the path early on to improve further on the vacuum pump before he could conduct any more blind testing in the hopes something viable would emerge. But at the end of this, 
He had a carbonized bamboo filament bulb that lasted not 40, but 1200 hours. Edison then figured out how to sell the light bulb by pioneering city-scale power generation and distribution on top of making the bulb itself practical. The former step of the process being the reason why people dismissively say Edison figured out how to sell the light bulb. He did, but that's only half. That is why Edison has been touted as the light bulb's inventor. Have whatever opinion you want though, because honestly it's reasonable to say that he was not the true inventor but he was much, much more than instrumental in its adoption and hardly stole anything. The credit can really go either way. The counter argument to this status quo concept is that ultimately Edison didn't bring anything scientifically original to the table. But if not Edison, then who? Because I cherry picked Swan, believe me, there are more options. Swan wasn't the first to make a light bulb, he just contributed the carbon filament. Frederick de Molines was 10 years earlier who got a patent for the light bulb, but also Warren de la Rue, who already made one a year earlier, but really 40 years before that, Humphrey Davy was the one behind the very basic notion of using electricity to produce light, or maybe Volta. And there are many other inventors who had incandescent lights that I haven't even mentioned. Where do you draw the line? But say if we assume Davy was the OG and without Davy there's no Rue or Frederick or Swan or Edison, then the fact remains that all Davy did was basically suggest electricity as a light source. Genealogically, what he made became closer to Victorian arc lamps than incandescent bulbs. You could draw a chain of one-way dependency, sure, but does that warrant the title of inventor of the light bulb? In my opinion, no, but this brings me to my second answer as to who invented the light bulb. Well, it's not my answer. It's been built up, refined, polished, and used by thousands before me. Mark Twain, one of those thousands, eloquently puts it like this. It takes a thousand men to invent a telegraph, or a steam engine, or a phonograph, or a telegraph, or any other important Thing. And the last man gets the credit and we forget the others. He added his little might. That is all he did. These object lessons should teach us that 99 parts of all things that proceed from the intellect are plagiarisms, pure and simple. And the lesson ought to make us modest, but nothing can do that. Society has devised a set of rules about who to call the inventor of what. The implication behind the word is the thousands of people that led up to it and the thousands more that then improved upon it. Both sides are guilty of ignoring this. A supposed douche CEO seems to be worth demonizing and discarding all the implications of the title of inventor and pecking at technicality. But should we praise Edison as a genius for upping the light bulb lifespan from 40 to 1200 hours? No. It was a simple thing he did. He was at the right time, had the right technology, read the right journal, and had the means to find a practical material. But we shouldn't praise Swan, or Rue, or Davy. Sometimes an invention has no discreet author, especially when it's circulating across the entire globe. In that case, the title lands in the lap of the person who made the thing practical, even if all they had to add was one last little mite. And it's worth noting, at the time, Swan and other inventors openly admired Edison's solution. They didn't feel stolen from. You can extrapolate this answer to the research facilities too, which I've seen them get a lot of flack for. As one article points out in defense of the light bulb, invention is not a business for individuals. It's collective. And Edison Invention Labs were the culmination of this, forecasting what would form the backbone of science in the information era. He pioneered an entire paradigm shift in the field of inventing, but he tarnished his legacy as a supposed thief because he did not embrace the collectiveness. He was an extremely prideful man. However, if his intelligence can be written off on the very basis of his labs, then so can anyone who works for or leads an organization with a collective intelligence and ends up taking the credit, like Steve Jobs or Bill Gates. They're both brilliant, even if in some cases all they did was add their little might. Criticism of Edison as a fake inventor, as nothing but a businessman who bought his way to the top and stole ideas along the way, is just a meme. A meme especially in the original linguistic sense. It's a narrative we've perpetuated among ourselves that ignores the real definition of inventor, probably so that we may act with righteous indignation and destroy with good conscience. You could have whatever opinion you want towards him, towards who really invented the light bulb, just to make sure it's for the right reasons and doesn't simplify things to black and white. Admittedly, 
you might find this lukewarm. You might find this whole video lukewarm. You might have been expecting me to dunk on one side or the other, to deliver one solid whammy about why Edison was in fact a genius, or to dig up something truly indefensible. By the way, do you like BuzzFeed Unsolved? Because I love it. I honestly wish Shane Madej would step on me. Sorry. I swear I'm gonna get back to Edison, this will be the last segue, I promise. But golly, do I love Unsolved. Except for one single episode, the episode that started me down the rabbit hole of this video, Louis Le Prince. It is just one example among many cold case productions that get one major detail wrong. It just goes to show how little research and thought goes into covering topics that deal with Big Bad Stinky Edison, as I've yet to come across any serious production that brings up what I have in store today about this man and his imperious mustache. For the uninitiated, you might have seen this image floating around on the internet, which somehow gives an even less nuanced take than a BuzzFeed production. But let me give my own background in as few words as I can manage. Basically, louis Imi Augustin Le Prince is the butchered name of a man that just objectively had a working motion picture camera and projector before Edison, before anyone. You are watching the oldest surviving film ever and it came from the prince's camera. His patent was delayed for about two years before he could register it. And when he got it after such delay, out of frustration, he ended up dropping crucial phrasing from the very patent that would go on to be defeated in court by Edison. We don't know if Edison was responsible for that or not. Instead, the story climaxes when, a day before Louis is set to reveal his invention to the world, he vanishes without a trace. There are many theories, but here's one piece of evidence no one ever talks about. Quote, as Bedford relates it, he was turning over some papers on Thomas Edison's work with lighting methods when he stumbled across a dilapidated leather-bound book. The book would turn out to be one of many notebooks in which Edison was fond of jotting down ideas and test data. He had found a small entry dated September 20th, 1890, by Edison's own hand, which read, Eric called me today from Dijon. It has been done. Prince is no more. This is good news, but I flinched when he told me. Murder is not my thing. I'm an inventor and my inventions for moving images can now move forward. After weeks of examining the journal to ascertain its authenticity, which included penmanship comparison with known Edison articles in a computed tomography scan, historian Robert E. Meyer agreed that the journal was indeed authentic and that the note dated September of 1890 was genuinely Edison's own. I'll admit, I don't know why he would write that down and incriminate himself, especially when he was so concerned with his public perception. Surely he must have figured out someone would come across that eventually. But that is pretty compelling evidence. There's little ambiguity in the note itself, except for the fact that maybe Edison had actually whacked famous singer Prince. I guess it'll remain unsolved. Jokes aside, I bring this up because despite everything I've said, despite me, let's be honest, mostly defending him through the whole video, I just want you to know that this is what reflects poorly on his character in a more universally accepted sense than anything we've covered. By a long shot. There's sanctioning animal cruelty, but then there's taking a life just to get ahead, just to steal from a dead man what would prove to be one of the most remarkable technologies of all time. There's no historical lens that can excuse that. He may as well have urinated on the prince's grave in that very act, which was then followed shortly by crushing his family in court because of a single conceited phrase on Louise Patton. This is repugnant. Not half or even 90% of all the criticisms levied against Edison compare, and no one talks about this. That image hardly does it justice. Alright, bear with me here, but I don't think this discounts what he's done for humanity. I understand that sounds horrible without context, but to clarify, I'm not saying let's forgive a murderer for his crimes because he was a smart guy. Instead, the point is, let's not dogpile in one direction. I've already thrown out some food for thought before talking about the prince that I hope you will consider, but now I want to make one final plea. To take a position and then filter everything about a person through that lens is extremely misguided and downright unhealthy. The thesis of this video is not Edison is actually a good guy. It's Edison wasn't as bad as you think. As bad as you've been led to believe by people who think our previous completely twisted version of Edison warrants replacement by another twisted version of Edison. You can hate him for the animal abuse or for being the embodiment of the vices of capitalism. But if the good doesn't negate the bad, then the bad doesn't negate the good. What I want you to take away from this video, what I want you to take away from a few videos on this channel, is to see things for what they are not just good or bad, and to be able to 
denounce Edison's predatory tactics and noxious levels of pride, while also being able to, with moral ease, appreciate what he's done for the world. Allow those thoughts to coexist with his legacy, because we are all human. The Oatmeal doesn't comprehend that phrase and begs the reader to pick a side and demonize the other. But, and I hate to be that person, look where that's gotten us. Look where that's gotten our social and political climate. Believe what you want, but build it on a solid foundation. If you don't, it will inevitably crumble. And if it was never solid, did you ever really believe in a righteous truth at all? Those are my thoughts, at least. Remember, you can have whatever opinion of Edison you want. The point of this video is not to win sides, it is to dispel misinformation. So write Edison bad till you die if you want, just make sure it's for the right reasons. And don't pretend humans can either be perfect or evil. But what do I think about this whole ordeal? Who do I think invented the light bulb? Is Edison worthy of all the flack he gets because of, say, Le Prince? I don't know about any of that, but I sure appreciate the epic rap battles of history video more than I ever wanted to. Alright, it's time to address the elephant in the room. If you remember this channel, I'm sure you've been thinking about it this whole video. You might have become used to it by the end, but I can only imagine how jarring it was. Well, clam fam, I am straight up mega sorry for not uploading my street cats. I know you've been wondering every single day all these months, just when am I going to see that pink dog again? First of all, I'm flattered, but not surprised in the slightest. I am aware of the effect I have on viewers. Anyway, since there's nothing else to address, thanks for watching. If you want to support the channel, share this video in whatever community you think it would fit in.